Why do some deities in some cultures want blood sacrifices of animals during their worship? Is it always a case of appeasing negative entities? Or are there some positive aspects of it as well? Great question. Oh, I don't think there are any positive aspects to it. Again, if I can start with the Bible, because that was where I began in, in my journey of exploration, there are beings in the Bible who want cattle and sheep. And they want them bled dry and then they want them burned. And it's not quite clear if those entities want them done that way because this is their food. These are edible offerings or if it's actually the, the burning of them and the inhal inhalation of the smoke that they derive pleasure from. That's a strange little spin in the biblical stories, but if we go around the world uh, and listen to stories of animal sacrifice, it seems to be much more that there are these non-human beings washing around in our stories who want food. And that is their food. And that's really what the temple sacrifices are all about. So if you go to um, the story of Bell and the Dragon in the Apocrypha, so this is one of the books that isn't in the mainstream canon of the Bible. It's in the larger secondary canon that included um, Hebrew literature that was Greek influenced. And there's an extension to the uh, book of Daniel, which talks about the Babylonians having a tent that they claimed had a dragon in it, an Elohim, a powerful one. And they claimed that the cattle and the sheep going there were being eaten by their dragon, by their Elohim. And it turned out to be fake. Their Elohim had actually been killed and it was the priests who were eating the edible offerings. So that story, when you put it in the context of the biblical story, suggests that the understanding was that the Elohim ate beef and lamb, and that's why they wanted all these sacrifices. But blood sacrifice gets a little bit darker than that. Um, in the first degree, it creates an artificial scarcity for all the tribes of Israel who are living off the land. So it's a farming culture. And so they depend on their livestock for food and drink and all the other materials derived from cattle. And that can be a very happy life uh, unless you have a famine or if you have some kind of artificial scarcity through having to pay tribute to a landlord or a chieftain or a king, or by having to pay tithes and tribute to your Elohim, your powerful one. And that indeed was the scenario, that the first fruits of your harvest and the best of your livestock had to be given to Yahweh. So if you had really healthy sheep with no blemishes, really healthy cattle with no blemishes, those were the ones you had to kill. You couldn't use them to strengthen your herd. You couldn't uh, eat them. You had to give them to the priests and they would kill them and they would eat them. And Yahweh would either eat them or just inhale the smoke. That is how the story goes. And so now all of a sudden there is far greater insecurity that the farmers have to contend with because they're always giving their best stuff away and they're having to recycle the rest for themselves and for their businesses. So that's a slightly darker layer to the story. And then a still darker layer about blood sacrifice is that in cultures all around the world, you can find this pattern of human sacrifice. And I, in my new book, The Invasion of Eden, I talk about the invasion of the Mo'o in the stories that I heard from my friends who are traditional healers on the island of Molokai. So this is the Hawaiian story of the invasion of the Mo'o and the Ahumanu and the Kaunas. And what the Ahumanu do is, well, you can find it dramatized in a movie like The Dark Crystal, Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal. 
And in that movie, you've got these horrible, nasty, desiccated old bird people who predate upon these innocent childlike gelflings. They catch them and terrorize them, and then they derive essence from these gelflings, which then feed the bird people and rejuvenate them. And I think that is uh, a picture of story you can find all around the world, in the Bible, in Mayan story, in African story, all around the world, the story of non-human governors in the deep past who feed off the terror of people and who feed off the terror of innocence. And that's really what these stories of blood sacrifice are all about. The entities governing are deriving energy from this. It's not just a power play. It's not just to show they have total control and then to get high from exercising that control. They are actually deriving something chemical from the whole process. And I do go into some depth in that story in the invasion of Eden and say this is not just an ancient story it's not just a Hawaiian story it's not just a biblical story and these stories have been curated carefully so that you can I can look at the world today and understand why things work in the way they do now so it's not something I talk about very often but it's there in the invasion of Eden and it should make us read those old stories of sacrifice with a far more open eye and a far more educated eye. My Bible history professor told us that the word prophet was actually a Greek concept. The actual word, he said, was nabi, which meant dance until you fall into a trance. Have you done any research on this? Yes, that's quite correct. And it's something I do go into in my new book, The Invasion of Eden. There are two words used mainly for prophet in the Hebrew scriptures, and one of them means a seer, and the other, I love the explanation that your professor gave. And what's interesting is that people often ask me, if we've been reading these stories wrong, if many of the supposed God stories of the Hebrew scriptures are really stories of powerful beings who came and colonized us, non-human entities who governed over us. Well, where does that put the prophecy of what Christians call the Old Testament? Because when you get to Jesus and the apostles, they often go to the Hebrew scriptures for prophetic messages or esoteric messages. How can there be messages about the future that are accurate or messages about Jesus that are accurate if really this isn't God's stuff, it's it's all ET stuff. And what I would say is this, that the Hebrew canon contains the kaleidoscope of cultural memory of the Hebrew people. It includes ancient memories of paleo contact, colonization. But within that culture, there were prophetic people, people we might call seers or sensitives or psychics, people who could do uh, remote viewing, future viewing. So, for instance, it's the prophet Micaiah. He's a seer, and he is able to remote view the El Ba'adat, the power council, and he can see that there are different kinds of Elohim, different kinds of powerful beings sitting in council trying to manipulate human society into warfare so they can feed off all the advantages, the negative energy of that. So Micaiah has this remote viewing ability. Or if you go to Isaiah, Joel, Jeremiah, they are able to future view an age beyond Judaism, an age beyond priesthoods, where people are just having direct experiences of source or direct experiences of the divine. Uh, they all have prophetic visions of things associated with the Christian era. And I think they were genuine sensitives. They were genuine seers. But there are people in every culture who have these abilities, people who are especially sensitive, who can 
uh, excel in far sight or future vision or telepathic connection. I think we all have these abilities. Probably every single one of us has had glimpses of these things, a little flash of future sight, a little flash of far sight. And then there are others who are more attuned to it. Every culture has it, and the Hebrew culture has it as well. And they call their people prophets or seers. Oh, I'll add something to that. The dancing until you're in an altered state of consciousness. Yes, that is one modality for prophecy. And you will find that in other traditions as well. If you go to some traditional healers, they will do that. They will use sound. They will use music. They will use chanting. They will use dance to induce an altered state of consciousness so they can achieve remote communication or far sight or x-ray vision, whatever it is they're aiming at. That's in the Bible too, but also the use of what the translators call aromatic oils. And so there are very particular oils they would use to infuse the inner tents of the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary of their temples, so that the priests who are breathing in this cocktail of oils are also experiencing an altered state of consciousness with the purpose of achieving contact with other kinds of entity. So that's part of the prophetic fabric of the Hebrew tradition as well. Hi, Paul. I'd love to know your insights into reincarnation. I have seen some past life regression sessions where these people experience past lives as a different species on other planets. Some even have past life memories as being Anunnaki. Do you have an opinion on this or references to any ancient writings regarding reincarnation? Thank you. Agoran Robson, 6243. Goran, that's a great question. And as you know, my background is from a Christian start point. I was 33 years in church-based ministry as a theological educator. And from the perspective of Christian theology, reincarnation doesn't get much of a look in. In fact, it would really be regarded as a heresy. But through the years, I've heard so many very compelling examples of memories of former lives shared by children, memories of lives in great detail. And one possible explanation for that is the idea of reincarnation of a soul or a conscious being living a sequence of lives on planet Earth. So just from the point of view of people's experiences, people's testimony, that has caught my attention. And I think there really are some very compelling cases of that kind. When I uh, began my research path that led to Escaping from Eden and all my work in paleo contact, I was reminded of the great role that Plato played in early Christianity. And I was reminded of the fact that the ideas of reincarnation were part of Platonic thought and early Christian thought. Now, elsewhere on the planet, there's no controversy around this. If you go to the East, if you go to India, listen to the teachings of Buddhism and Hinduism, ideas of reincarnation are really central to that worldview. The idea that we are primarily beings of consciousness having a material experience, that's central to those Eastern worldviews. And it was there in the grassroots at the dawn of the Christian era as well. So it gets referenced in the Gospels, for instance. There's a moment where the disciples are asked by Jesus, who do people say I am? And one of the answers is, well, a lot of people think you are a reincarnation of one of the prophets, by which they meant the Jewish prophets. They think you are a reincarnation of Elijah or, or one of the other prophets. And so we can see from that answer that even in first century of the common era Judaism, ideas of reincarnation were part of mainstream conversation, and mainstream thinking. Jewish people thought Jesus might be a reincarnation of a previous master. So it's there, 
And it's there in the writings of some of the church fathers, the, the founders of Christian theology. So if you go to Origen, who's regarded as the founder of hermeneutics, that's the principles of interpreting ancient texts, and he applied those to the Bible, go to Origen, go to Clement of Alexandria, a foundational church father for the Eastern tradition of Christianity. They both had a tentative belief in reincarnation. They talked about it. They believed it was possible. They saw it as being in no way in conflict with the teachings of Jesus. And one of the reasons they were thinking about it and talking about it was because it was part of Greek thought by that time as well. So writers like Plato, and Plato really is at the zenith of philosophical thought of that time and, and throughout time, really, he toyed with the idea of reincarnation as well. And he argued on the basis of what we might call science, logic applied to things we can all observe, that we are primarily beings of consciousness, having a material experience. And he suggested that after this material experience, one possibility is that we go on to a completely different kind of experience, perhaps somewhere else in the cosmos, or that we have to stick around to process the experience we just had here, or there's the possibility that we might go on to another experience, but not elsewhere in the cosmos, right here on planet Earth. And because it was in Plato, that's why it was in the Church Fathers. And so for all those reasons, things I can find in the Christian tradition, in Plato, who was a wonderful synthesizer of international thought, in Eastern thought, and through experiences that people are having to this present day, it's a possibility I take very seriously. And I would say, yes, I lean in that direction. Yes, I do believe that happens. Could you explore and break down what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah from your unique view on the Bible? It would be great to hear. Thanks for the great content. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah is an anomalous story, really, from the book of Genesis. Uh, the way the translation rolls at the moment, the Yahweh character takes great offense at the behavior of the people in those cities, which is an odd thing because he hasn't imposed any laws on those cities they're not people under his charge as such. He's not there leading them, telling them what to do, and they're disobeying him. He just doesn't like how they're behaving. And so there's something slightly out of tune, out of time with the framework for why Yahweh or El Shaddai, as he introduces himself in that story, uh, goes on and destroys those cities. It follows on from a really interesting encounter between Abraham and Sarah and three visitors. Now, Abraham and Sarah, as the story goes, are an older couple. They're post-childbearing, but uh, the reader of the Bible knows that they are actually the progenitors of the Hebrew people. And their names, when we read them against Brahma and Saraswati in the Vedas suggest they might be a more primordial couple even than that. Brahma and Saraswati in the Vedic tradition are the progenitors of humanity. They are the progenitors of the many nations. Abraham, we're told, is the father of many nations or the many nations. And then there is a, a supernatural or divine or perhaps what we would call artificial uh, insemination that results in children and nations issuing from them. What causes this anomalous pregnancy is a close encounter with three entities. Now, it turns out they're not human. At the beginning of the story, they're just reported as three people turning up. But by the time they've moved on, we've worked out they're not human. They are advanced beings of some kind, 
and they clearly have technology when it comes to pregnancy that Abraham and Sarah knew nothing about, and it took them completely by surprise that postmenopausal Sarah was now pregnant. So that's the story before. There's a conversation between Abraham and one of these three figures who has said he's going to go and destroy these cities because he doesn't like how the people there behave. And then two of those figures turn up and they have an extraordinary effect on the locals. If you could imagine what would happen if Justin Bieber walked through an airport, for instance, and uh, the way he would be mobbed, um, people trying to tear the T-shirt off his back, that kind of thing. That's what happened to these two figures when they got to Sodom. So clearly they looked human, but they were, they were hot humans, and they had this extraordinary effect on people. And this is all given by the writers a sort of explanation as to why you'd want to destroy those cities, which again seems a little odd and, and out of proportion. The way the cities are destroyed uh, is very suggestive to the modern mind of advanced weaponry. If we picture what happens to a city if it is nuked, that's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's no explanation of this technology in the text. The context for its destruction is the introduction of this being called El Shaddai. Now, El Shaddai in a lot of Bibles gets translated as the Almighty. But if you go to the most authoritative uh, lexicons, they will tell you honestly that is an invented translation. Brown Driver Briggs will tell you that's an invented translation. Go to the New Jerusalem Bible, and it will say that's a very uncertain translation. Go further into the notes, and they'll tell you it more probably means the powerful one of the mountains, the powerful one of the plains, or possibly the powerful one, the destroyer. And when you look at how El Shaddai behaves in the texts, it's that final meaning that makes sense, because wherever he turns up, whether in the plains or on the mountains, he goes about destroying people. He slaughters people in great numbers. And that's exactly what happens in the Sodom and Gomorrah story. He turns up, introduces himself to Abraham. He says, I'm the powerful one, the destroyer. Walk in front of me. Don't put a foot wrong. And within a couple of chapters, he's destroyed two cities. And it's the beginning of stories in the Hebrew scriptures of extraordinary destructions of cities by means that would have been uh, unimaginable to the people of that time. I mean, to have weaponry that could take out a city, we can picture it, we can process that idea, but people three and a half thousand years ago couldn't, but they just told the stories how their ancestors had remembered them. So that's the context in which I understand that story. I don't really take the top layer um, as gospel. I don't think it was a punishment for bad behavior. I think there's something else going on here. I think it was El Shaddai who did it. I think it was through technology that it was done. And it's one of those stories in the Bible that clues us that what we're actually looking at is some kind of an invasion and a taking of power by advanced beings with advanced weaponry. Paul, I had always felt, even in childhood, that we have others that are here to assist us. I was laughed at, saying that I made it up, thereby having to go to confession for it. This made me question religion. Well, CJ, I'm so sorry you had to go to confession for that, because what you were experiencing is something that people experience all around the world. And if you had simply grown up in another country, where you have shamanic traditions or traditional healers, you would have had people around you who would have told you, uh, CJ, you're absolutely sound, you're absolutely sane, this is true, this is an experience we all have. Yes, we do have helpers there to assist our progress through life. When I first started hearing this, it was, I suppose, from people that we might call sensitives or psychics, and I was he hearing this as a Christian pastor and thinking, well, are they experiencing God? Uh, is this the Holy Spirit? Is this 
angels, and I was trying to process it through this grid of Christian theology. And what I didn't know is that there are some aspects of Christian theology that were live in the beginning, at the beginning of the Christian story, but which got lost, which didn't get preached on, which had been neglected. And two examples of this would be Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, which speaks about our spiritual ancestors surrounding us. There's this passage that uh, describes all these amazing spiritual ancestors and their ex exploits and how great they were. And then the writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded, he doesn't say preceded. He says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of, he doesn't say predecessors, he says witnesses, that's people watching us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so he gives this picture of each one of us having our ancestors looking at us, hopefully wanting to support us in our progress through life, wanting to encourage us to excel, almost as if they're looking and saying, OK, what are you going to do with our DNA? And they wish us well. And that picture is something that is believed in very strongly if you go to a Nanga or Sangoma in Southern Africa, if you've gone there for advice or for healing, they believe that's very real. The traditional healer will expect to tune in to messages from your ancestors or the spirits of your ancestors to support you in your healing or in your decision making. And I had no idea until I revisited these texts in the last few years, that's there in primitive Christianity as well. And then there's another really interesting verse in the New Testament, 1 John 4, where the writer clearly expects the early Christians to be having contact experiences with spirits. And he never defines what he means by spirits. Does he mean the spirits of ancestors? Does he mean energy-based beings? In some cultures, the word spirit just means a being or a person who can materialize in your room or on your property and you don't know how they got there and then they disappear by some means that you don't understand. In some cultures, if a being has advanced transportation that can get them from the sky to the earth, they'll be called a spirit. Well, the writer of 1 John 4 doesn't tell us which of those he means, simply that he expects people to be having encounter experiences with mysterious beings and that people can expect to derive good information from them. But he insists we should keep our sovereignty. It's not a matter of believing every voice you hear or doing everything that you think some voice has told you to do. We're sovereign beings. So whatever you think you're hearing, you have to weigh up, does that make sense to me? Do I need to do anything about that? You are in charge of yourself, and that's what the writer insists on. And I find that very, very sound advice. And when I talk to people of other spiritual traditions, I find it very interesting that, for instance, if I talk to a sensitive or a psychic or a, uh, a consciousness worker or a light worker, they will often be a little bit vague as to how they get their insight and whose are the voices that are guiding them. And at one level, it doesn't matter too much as long as they're weighing everything up. And asking, does that make sense? Do I need to repeat that? Do I need to do anything about that? And that's the worldview I've come to. It's really been anchored for me through my work as a pastor and a coach. I, from time to time, will find myself coaching somebody and I'll say, do you know what? I'm coming to believe that every one of us has an invisible team of helpers around us whose job is to support us and assist us through life. I have yet to say that and not have the other person say, I'm coming to believe that too. But it's not because they've been taught it. In fact, they might have had to have gone to confession for it as well. They're coming to believe it because they are experiencing it and they are trying to get their head around these little coincidences, these random thoughts, these thoughts that seem to come from outside their own thinking that have helped them and supported them. And so I find it interesting that it's not something that's taught in school, in church, in, in Western culture, and yet people are experiencing it every bit as much as people who've grown up in Southern Africa 
having been mentored by a shaman or they've done traditional initiation. So I think it's a profoundly human experience. I think it's a universal experience. And I think it's a wonderful experience when we learn to tune into it. Where do you get your glasses or who is your favorite glasses brand? Oh, Chris, thank you for asking me that question. Thank you for noticing. My favorite brand is Kirk and & Kirk's. And uh, there are lots of uh, famous people who favor this brand. Uh, a lot of blokes, when they lose their hair, uh, need a stronger set of frames. And that's exactly what I did. And I happen to have a friend, Jason Kirk, who I was at school with, who has this fabulous brand, Kirk & Kirk's. The technology they have in that company means they can create far more interesting colors in their frames, hence this very vivid blue. And his wife, Karen, is the designer. So Jason founded the company. He revived his grandfather's company that had been making spectacles way back in the 1920s, I think it was. And then Karen has produced these wonderful, really bold designs. And once I realized I needed stronger frames, I thought, how can I buy anyone else's? I've got to buy my friends, Jason and Karen's frames. And I do like them because they are such strong shapes. They're such strong colors. And I've never had more compliments on my eyewear than when I've worn Kirk and Kirk. So if you're looking for a really good brand, let me uh, send you their way. If you enjoy our content here on Fifth Kind TV and would like to support our work, please would you consider subscribing to our new website, fifthkind.tv. Here we will have our full catalogue of material along with exclusive access to interviews and documentary content. Sign up today, become part of the community, become part of the conversation. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you there.